Welcome everyone to the ninth webinar in Contact's Produce Safety Webinar Series. This second season will tackle a new fresh produce food safety topic every month through a dynamic webinar series that will continue to bring together industry, academia, and regulatory minds to solve some of the produce industry's biggest and most timely issues. This series is part of a larger industry outreach and risk mitigation project called CONTACT, or Scientific Challenges and Cost-Effective Management of Risks Associated with Implementation of Produce Safety Regulations. This project is supported by the Specialty Crops Research Initiative from the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the view of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This webinar series, coupled with other research and extension efforts, is part of a collaborative effort across 10 different universities and government institutions to enhance produce safety knowledge and compliance across the industry. We are so grateful to our collaborators for their effort and support of this webinar series. The webinar series will continue next month with a talk by Dr. Shauna Rock about assessing and ranking risks in production water use on Thursday, November 10th, 2022. This year's webinar series will address brand new topics chosen by you. We've got an exciting new list of webinars scheduled for this year, covering topics like sanitation, foodborne outbreak attribution, and much more. If you think of a topic, or one is missing from this list, please let us know in the comments, webinar surveys, or our social media pages. While the webinar series lets us meet with you once a month, that's just not enough for us. We'd love to hashtag make contact with you about today's webinar or other produce safety news and research on our Twitter and Instagram pages. Follow us on these platforms at PS underscore side. A quick reminder for today, if you would like to submit a question for our speaker during or before the Q&A session, please submit your questions through the Q&A box and not the chat box. Now, let's welcome our speaker today, Dr. Keith Schneider. Keith Schneider is currently a professor and extension specialist in the Food Science and Human Nutrition Department at the University of Florida. His activities focus on teaching, research, and numerous extension projects. His research and extension work specializes in food safety microbiology, focusing on the production, harvest, and packing, transportation, retail, and consumer handling of food products. He received his master's in public health from the University of South Florida and his PhD from the University of Florida Food Science and Human Nutrition Department. As an alum, welcome, Keith. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Again, my name is Keith Schneider. I'm a professor here in the University of Florida, and I want to thank Lauren Alexis for setting this up. This is a lot of work behind the scenes. Our grant supervisor, my partner in grime here at Florida, Michelle Danilik, and of course, the folks at USDA for giving us this opportunity. Today's talk is post harvest water things to consider what i want to focus on is why harvest and post harvest water is so important we're going to talk about the sanitizers and why we use them in post harvest water i'm going to spend a lot of time part of the bulk of the conversation today is going to be on understanding sanitizer chemistry oh because i think that's one of the most misunderstood and uh, one of the most important things especially when we're going to talk a lot about hypochloric chemistry We'll talk a little bit about some of the considerations, problems, and monitoring, and what you might want to focus on, and then some sort of practical real-life stuff out when we get to the end. So <clears throat> the initial question is, why focus on post-harvest water? Despite the ever-changing and ongoing regulations, there's really no way we're going to remove every risk from the field. Unless, of course, we can close everything and we vacuum seal, maybe irradiate everything. There's always gonna be some amount of risk associated with produce coming in from an environment that is open to the elements. There's always gonna be some potential, albeit small, that we're gonna bring a pathogen in and we're going to have some type of risk uh, of potentially spreading that around. And 
really the take home point number one in this whole presentation is post harvest water use is probably the one area where we have the potential of turning a small problem into a very large problem. And that's really the focus on today. It's the main tenant. Our whole goal here is, again, we're never going to reduce the potential contamination to zero. What we want to do is keep it as low as possible where it affects the least amount of people and hopefully it doesn't lead to any clinical manifestation. And, th and that's really our goal. So there are a lot of different uses of water. Some of them we think about because they're really obvious. And some of them we don't think about that often. We use water during harvest, whether it's cleaning buckets or shears field bins. Remember, this water is any water that is at the time of harvest, literally to the time it leaves your plant. We use it in recirculating flumes. We can use it in a single pass operation where we're using a brush bed or a spray bar. Hydrocoolers are another area. Again, we're trying to remove field heat and we're using a recirculating shower, which is a hybrid between a spray bar and a recirculation system. Ice is the one that we constantly miss. It's funny, we'll produce ice and we'll, if you've ever been to a large facility, it's produced and it's just laid out onto the ground. And then we have a front loader come in and we'll just scoop it up and we might top vegetables with that. And again, any of that ice as it melts has potential for bringing any contamination that comes in on the ice and spreading it to a stack or a rack of produce. And in fact, any pathogen that might be on that produce to begin with, and it would have been limited to just maybe one floret, as you see poking out there in the upper right. Now I have the potential as that ice melts is just having that pathogen flow through that entire stack of products. And then we use water for, again, personal hygiene, sanitation, facilities, a whole bunch of other things. And we want to make sure that this water is of adequate quality that we're not going to introduce and or spread these pathogens that may get into our system. And again, exacerbating the problem of a pathogen making into our facility. Current regulations, if you've got any PASA training, no detectable generic E. coli in 100 mils of sample. This isn't changing though. There's a lot of changes coming to the water regulations. As far as we know, these are not going to change. So really when we think about this, this is any water that's coming into direct contact with our covered produce during or after harvest, if it comes in contact with any food, co food contact service, making ice or hand washing. So this water has to be clean. It has to be of a certain quality. We really don't have any room here for any mistakes. But when we talk about what we're gonna do, some of the sanitizers and what's required of you, some of it's gonna make sense. Some of it's gonna be a little bit scratch your head moment. But again, we wanna use water that's not going to introduce any pathogens. And then we're gonna maybe use sanitizers for some additional protection and we'll get into that. Now, what post-harvest water is not? One, post-harvest water wash is not a kill step. And this seems counterintuitive, right? We're gonna be, in some cases, adding a sanitizer, which has a known sanitizing or disinfection property to it. We know it inactivates microbes, but yet we're not calling this a kill step. And this is a subtle difference, but we're not using a sanitizer in water as a kill step. We're using it as a method to make sure that we meet the requirements of no generic E. coli. And we're also using it to prevent cross-contamination, the spreading of a pathogen that might make it into our system from jumping onto a piece of uncontaminated fruit. Again, subtle difference, but remember, Post-harvest water is not a kill step. Another thing that it's not is it's not a catch-all to slack off on the use of gaps. We're going to be using good agricultural practices in the field. We may be using the full produce safety rules and requirements, but again, the use of a sanitizer in, in post-harvest water is not to be used in the absence of or laxing of the rules of gaps. It's in use in tangent with that. And lastly, even though I'm using a sanitizer, it is not or will not unadulterated contaminated product. So if your product comes in contact with floodwaters, when you hear about pre-harvest water, again, you're not going to contaminate. You're not going to unadulterate that contaminated product. So anytime we're talking about using a disinfectant or sanitizer in the water, we're not talking about fixing a problem. What we're trying to do is prevent a problem. So again, this is a really important concept that we want to get across. So what is post-harvest water for? Uh, again, I can use it in personal hygiene and porta potties I can use it in product conveyance. Again, flume or dump tanks. I can use it for the removal of soil or debris. I, as simple as a garden hose washing off a bin of 
carrots or leafy greens, or maybe I'm using it in a spray bar or some other type of operation. I can use it to remove field heat and cooling. Hydro coolers are a classic example of this. I'm going to shower it with cold water. I'm going to remove that field heat. I'm going to extend shelf life. So again, we want to make sure that water is of adequate quality for that activity. And again, I can use it for cleaning the facilities and sanitation around my plant. Again, I'm just going to reinforce the fact that this is not a kill step. Now, will I get a lowering of surface microbe levels on, in this case, apples or tomatoes in a system? Yeah, I probably will. Is it going to be adequate enough to ensure that every piece of fruit is going to be safe, like a pasteurization step or cooking step? No, I cannot. And this is why we're not going to use it as a kill step. Since I can't guarantee that 100% removal that I can in a cooking or a pasteurization type of a process step, really legally, I'm only using it as a means for preventing cross-contamination or the spread of a potential micro that comes in the system. Now, again, I, am I going to reduce the bacterial numbers? Yeah. Can I use it to reduce market diseases or spoilage organisms? Yep, sure can, but we're not going to consider this a kill step. It has legal implications when we call it such, and we're just not going to do it. We're just going to get ourselves in trouble if we do that. Here's another important thing to remember. This is take-home point number two. If I'm going to use a sanitizer in post-harvest wash water, that's up to you. The produce safety rule has no mandated requirement for the use of any sanitizer in wash water. Again, I can't have any E. coli in a system. How I guarantee that in a recirculating water system? It's a mystery to me, but you are not required to use a sanitizer. Now, if you do use it to wash your produce, you have to use a suitable disinfectant or sanitizer to now wash water. You have to use it according to the label's instructions. You have to use it for the time period specified, and it has to be EPA registered. So while you're not required to use a sanitizer, if you do, you have to then follow all the rules governing said sanitizer. So that's one of the things that, I, again, we get a lot of questions on as well. Is there a requirement? Nope, you don't have to use a sanitizer, but all you have to do is maintain the quality of that water and make sure that you're not going to have any detectable E. coli like during the entire process. And that becomes problematic, but we'll move on. So why is it important? And again, there's really no sort of direct evidence. Again, by the time you go through an investigation and you get back to the facility, unless you actually have a situation where you were measuring sanitizers in a system and it zeroed out on you where we can actually pinpoint that, yeah, that was the cause of an outbreak. Now, the one outbreak, the Romaine lettuce outbreak in the fall of 2018, if you look at the FDA's concluding remarks on that, there was water on farm in a reservoir where the outbreak strain was found. It was not effectively treated with a sanitizer and may have led to the contamination of the water directly contacting the Romaine lettuce. And that I'm paraphrasing from the actual FDA report. I've got the link down on there on the bottom. But this is one of those situations where, one, we were introducing water into that system. And in fact, the water found in the reservoir was used to actually directly contact the produce being processed. So this is one of these areas where, again, we just want to emphasize and stress, if one, we're never going to reduce all the pathogens coming into the facility. We want to stop the spread or the cross-contamination. And the other thing that we might want to do, too, in, in certain situations, is if I'm bringing in pathogens, I don't want to let them get established in my system and potentially form biofilms. So again, use of sanitizers also has the ability to knock down that potential buildup of biofilms especially in the sanitation process. So again, it's super important. Its direct impacts are really hard to measure. But again, this is one of those areas where we want to do everything we possibly can to keep that risk as low as possible. The water, I can use well water. I can use municipal water. I can use treated water, but I no longer at this particular point during harvest or post-harvest activities use untreated surface water for these activities. There's really no way to guarantee that I have no E. coli in the water. Any test I would do on a micro scale would be problematic because I wouldn't get the results back for a couple of days. So there's no way I could kind of just test the water and just cross my fingers that I'm not going to get any E. coli. Nor, even if I test for just background microbes, am I going to know if in fact I've spread a salmonella or a any other particular pathogens that might have come in on that produce. Untreated surface water, we cannot use for these activities. 
But again, I'm going to be maybe using, again, a well water municipal or, again, a treated reservoir. I can use this water as single pass and recirculated. Recirculated water has a greater potential for contamination, again, whether it's in a bulk tank, it's some recirculating flume, or another type of soak tank. The kind of in-between here would probably be in a situation where I have a situation where I'm using recirculating water, but I'm not using an immersion. Uh, so a batch or bulk water or flume tank, these are going to be immersion systems where I'm using them for conveyance. Something like a hydro cooler is more of a spray, uh, but typically isn't single pass. Hydro coolers don't have issues with immersion. And we'll talk about that when we talk about infiltration. But in those situations, I might use that water for extended period of time. So in a recirculating system where a flume tank, I may be changing that water out once a day. Hydro coolers may use that water for seven days or more. So we run into issues, especially anytime we recirculate water, we have the potential for spreading pathogens. And we want to really make sure, again, if we're in those situations, sanitizers are highly recommended. Again, not required, highly recommended to make sure that we're not spreading contamination. And we'll talk about those. So let's talk about sanitizers now. What is the perfect sanitizer? Now, there's a couple of things that we want to look for in the perfect sanitizer. It's going to demonstrate efficacy of, I guess, a wide range of the pathogens that we're concerned about, whether they be bacterial, parasites, viruses. Again, we want to make sure that it's going to work on everything. It won't form any harmful byproducts. That would be good, good for the environment, good for humans. So again, ideally, this is not going to produce any harmful byproducts. It's not going to damage our produce. Matter of fact, it's going to extend shelf life to the max. That would be perfect. It's going to be inexpensive. We don't want to spend a whole lot of money. It will be non-corrosive. We want to be compatible with the equipment that we have in the facility. We also don't want it to be harmful to the individuals working in the facility. If at all possible, we'd love to have it have residual activity. That'd be great, right? We want it to continue to keep acting. And we want it to be EPA approved. Problem is, there isn't a single sanitizer out there that meets all of these requirements. We'll be lucky if it meets one or two of these. So that's the difficulty because we're going to, we'll probably pose the question later, but what's the perfect sanitizer for me to use? Mm, it really depends. And again, I hate to, I wish I gave a more concrete answer than that, but it really does depend. What's the value of your crop? Are you producing organically? Do you have new equipment that may be stainless steel or do you have old equipment that may be more prone to rusting out? So all of these things are, you're going to need to take into consideration. All of them have their benefits. And we're only going to talk about a limited number because of the of a time constraint. We'll talk about two commonly used sanitizers, but there's a whole bunch out there. And what you do is you have a pro, pros and cons table here and you figure out what makes the most sense for you. And like I said, we'll talk about a couple different examples. So again, what's the best sanitizer out there? And that really it's going to matter on what your facility is like. What's that crop being packed? Are you packing organic or to be labeled organic product? How's the water going to be applied? Are you applying this as a as an overhead spray, single pass, or are we going to go be in a recirculated system? Recirculated water is going to start building up organic load in there that is going to be antagonistic to some sanitizers. Some are more resistant, and we'll talk about those. How long are you going to use that water before it's replaced? Because as you continue using that water, you may need to add more and more sanitizer to, to maintain its efficacy. Now, certain sanitizers are going to maintain their efficacy longer under load. So while they may be more expensive in the beginning, I may not have to replace them as often. So depending on what is being used, certain operations that I visited, especially here in Florida, some of them will actually use a combination They'll use a primary and secondary wash, one to do the bulk conveyance and the other is more of a secondary treatment to knock down as much of the surface micro as they can. So again, there, you may use a single one or you may use these in combination. All the sanitizers that we talk about, or again, the ones we'll talk about today and the ones that you may use are all going to be affected by a couple of different things. Now, when you go through the PSA training course, what you'll see are these three titles, and then they may get one additional slide, monitoring pH. And uh, depending who's giving the talk, you might spend, I don't know, five minutes on this slide. I'll spend about 30 minutes. I've actually taken that one principle, and we're going to do it a little bit today, and I've expanded it into a, an entire hour lecture of its own. The temperature of the water makes a big difference, especially here in Florida, 
We'll talk about the influences of temp- temperature and what it has. And then we'll talk about, we mentioned turbidity and in a standard training where we only have about an hour to go through section 5.2. We'll breeze through this. And again, depending who's given that lecture, anywhere from 50 minutes to maybe 90 minutes. And we don't really spend a whole lot of time on turbidity and it really has a significant impact. And we'll discuss that when we talk about the actual uh, sanitizers. Now, certain things we don't talk about is what concentrations to use. And that's hit or miss. And it really has to do a lot on these three different parameters here. But sanitizer concentration is super important because remember, we want to maintain efficacy. And then one that we rarely touch on is the contact time. How long are is my product going to be in contact with the water and a sanitizer if I'm using one? And again, that's rarely discussed and it has a big, big impact on, again, efficacy. Typically, when we do these types of talks, we concentrate on maybe s- several different, as many as five different compounds, hypochlorites, peracetic or peros- peroxyacetic acids, chloride oxide, sometimes we'll bring in ozone, sometimes we'll even talk about UV light and maybe other acid sanitizers. But because we have limited time, and I really want to, I want to beat up hypochlorites a lot today, we're going to spend most of our time talking about just hypochlorite and peroxyacetic acid. But just realize there are others out there that are just as good and that may make sense for your operation. But for the most part, again, we're going to concentrate on these other two, but I don't want to get leave you with the impression that those are the only two out there. There are plenty of them, plenty of others out there that may make economic sense or may make efficacious sense for you to explore. But again, for the sake of time, I really only want to talk about the two most commonly used chemistries out there and what makes them so efficacious and what can make them or short circuit what makes them efficacious. So first one we're going to hit on here is the hypochlorites. Now, hypochlorites come in a lot of or several different forms. The most common one, sodium hypochlorite, is one we have around the house typically is household bleach. That's another name for it, but the chemical name is sodium hypochlorite. NaOCl. We can use calcium hypochlorite, which is a solid form. NaOCl is a liquid form as with bleach. Calcium hypochlorite is a solid. If you have a pool or ever been around pools, these are those solid tablets that you see. We can also use chlorine gas. And if we just bubble chlorine gas into water, the interesting thing is if I use any one of these three, I add them to water, what I end up with is hypochlorous acid. And this is our main chemical agent that we're going to be used for killing pathogens. So again, I put these in water and boom, what I get out is hypochlorous acid or free chlorine. Problem is, and this is again, what we skip over a little bit when we do some of these talks is that hypochlorous acid doesn't exist by itself. It exists in equilibrium depending on the pH of the water. And this is why the pH slide that you normally get is important. Why do we even talk about pH? And typically why we talk about pH is this chemical reaction or this equilibrium. Depending on the pH of a system, hypochlorous acid, HOCl, will disassociate and form hypochlorite ion. And this is all pH dependent. Now, both of these are measured as free chlorine. So HOCl and OCl minus, when you add them up, that's our total free chlorine in the system. The issue is that hypochlorous acid is about 80 times more efficacious than OCl minus. OCl minus isn't completely ineffective, it's really a lot less effective. We want to optimize our system to be as OCL heavy as possible. And this is why your pH of your system is so important. When we're measuring these again, both of them are measured as free chlorine, but again, that OCL minus is not very efficacious. Now, one thing though, if you notice there's something missing here, it's the other part of the equation that we really never talk about that often. And there we go. The missing part of the equation is the leftover sodium. And there's a a hydroxyl group too that's missing. And what we end up with is sodium hydroxide. So as we're adding sodium hypochlorite to the system, we're generating that really wonderful HOC chemistry that's going to be doing our disinfection, but we're also adding sodium hydroxide. Now, if you're not familiar with sodium hydroxide is a base. A base added to any water system is going to raise your pH. And as I raise my pH, what's going to end up happening is I'm going to shift my equilibrium to favor that OCL minus form. So as I shift my pH or I add more sodium hydroxide to my system, what ends up happening is I start driving my chemistry towards a very inactive form 
of free chlorine. So I'm just going to make the situation worse the more I add. So this is counterintuitive. So you're saying the more bleach I add to the system, the more sodium hypochlorite I add, the worse it's going to get. And the answer is, yeah, it's actually true. And I'm going to give you a couple of animated slides here to illustrate that point a little bit. So first, let's back up and let's talk about pH. Because again, we mentioned pH. We don't really go over it a whole lot. And most of you or many of you are going to be very familiar with the pH scale. But again, if you're an educator and you're giving this to an audience, they may not be as familiar with it as you think. But again, just for review sake here, pH is measured on a scale of 0 to 14. Anything, again, 7 is going to be considered neutral pH. Anything below 7 is what we consider is acidic. Anything, again, as we slide down. And again, neutral pH is bottled water, acidic product. And I'm going to hold my diet beverage up here. It's a carbonated beverage. It's going to have a pH of about 2.5. It's going to be fairly acidic. Anything that's above 7, we're going to consider it to be alkaline. So anything above pH 7 is going to be basic or we're going to consider alkaline. And again, sodium hydroxide kind of caps out around pH 10. And that's really important. And I want to show you that. But just to put some numbers to this, at around pH 7.5, which is the pK, the value at which the OC, HOCl and the OCl minus are about a 50-50 split is right at 7.5. Now, if I were to reduce the pH by one unit, I drop my pH down to 6.5, what ends up happening is I get a 90-10 split. 90% of my HOCl is going to be in the free and active form, and only about 10% is going to be in the OCl minus or free and less active form. Now, if I let my pH drift up a bit, let's just say I don't want to mess around with acidifying my system. And I, I don't monitor, I maintain my pH and I just kind of drift up. I just keep adding my sodium hydroxide in there. And it the pH slips up to 8.5, just one unit higher than that midpoint. The ratio flips. I go from 90% active and 10% less active to 10% active and only 90% in the inactive form or less active form. So we really want to do or maintain that neutral, that 7.5 to 6.5, they get the most efficacious ratio of my free and active versus free and less active form. And I'm going to put that on a, a different type of a scale here. And I have my chlorine gas in green, my HOCl, which is our free and active form, and my OCl in red uh, in my free and less active form. So Let's give an example of some numbers here. So let's just say I'm putting in 100 part per million and my pH is at 7.5. What's that going to do is just going to yield approximately 50 ppm of HOCl and 50 ppm of OCl minus. And that's pretty good. 50 ppm of active, free and active chlorine is a fair amount in a system, especially in a clean water system. Now, if I were to just acidify that just a little bit, I can add inorganic or even organic acid, inorganics like a phosphor, I can change that ratio to 90, 10. In this case, I'm going to get 90 ppm of my HOCl. I get a lot more bang for my buck here. I can maximize that free and active form because now I only have 10 ppm in the free and less active form. Again, if I just take the brute force of mindset and I just add more sodium hypochlorite and I want to reach my 100 ppm, and my pH goes to 8.5, I'm only going to get 10 ppm now of my free and active form here. And really what can happen is as I continue to add sodium hypochlorite to the system, it's going to continue raising the pH. And more than likely, if I keep adding it, not only will I be at 8.5, I'll probably have closer to 9.5. And at that point, if I'm not maintaining or monitoring my pH in my closed water system, what can end up happening is now I'm putting in 100 part per million, and at 9.5, I'm only going to have 1 ppm in the active, free and active form, and 99% of it's going to be in that less active OCL minus form. And that could be, that could lead to a point where I'm going to get cross-contamination. I'm not going to have enough active sanitizer in my water. So just continuing to add sodium hypochlorite is not going to yield a whole lot of active chemistry. And at that point, I can have a failure in the system and a pathogen can make it through. And not only make it through, it can spread from one piece of fruit in a flume system to another. 
Whereas if I only had one piece of uh, fruit that came in contaminated, now I have a chance of spreading it to other fruit around it. And now maybe I have not one, but maybe a hundred make it through the system. And now rather than maybe finding one susceptible individual or maybe a, a dose finding it to a, a non-susceptible person who's not going to show clinical symptomologies. If now I make a hundred pieces contaminated, I may have a higher risk of finding an individual who is going to be susceptible to, to that dose of pathogen that makes it through the system. By maintaining a higher level of sanitizer in that water, just by changing the pH ever so slightly, I can reduce that risk greatly. And again, I want to maintain, again, that maybe 90-10 split rather than a 10-90 split. Now, you may say to yourself, if changing the pH, just one pH unit is going to get me back 90%, why don't I just jack the pH down to 5.5? Get, a, get 99% in the active form. And this is a situation where maybe too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And as you start getting really low in pH, what can happen is we get into a situation where we start eluding chlorine gas now. We can start breaking down that chemistry and we can start producing chlorine gas. And this is one, one of the reasons, especially during COVID, we always give out the very a stern warning, never mix bleach with vinegar. And this actually happened to a woman who nearly asphyxiated herself, is that in a, in a system, especially small systems, if you were to over acidify, you can drop below this 5.5 level, and then you have the potential for producing chlorine gas, which can be an OSHA issue where we can start running into worker issues and inhalation issues where that chlorine gas is going to cause illness to our workers. Acidification is good, but it has to be done under controlled situation because we really don't want to drop below six here. As we start getting into that 5.5 below um, system, we can start eluding chlorine gas and then we start having other problems. So we want to maximize the amount in the HOC form, but we don't want to maximize it too much. And again, that could lead to other problems. But here's a diagram that I blatantly stole from a colleague up in the University of Georgia, Laurel Dunn, but it really illustrates very simply when we talk about the chlorine doses that we give. Now, we put in our 100 ppm of chlorine. Let's say this, go back, continue in that example. And we have our chlorine dose. Now, what's going to end up happening, though, is going to start reacting with other things in that water. So I'm going to have a measurable amount of free chlorine, but some of that chlorine is going to react with organic and inorganic molecules in the water. So not everything that you put in is going to be freely available. And we're in the next slide, we're going to go over a break point that's going to explain this a little bit better. But again, I may put in 100, but it may combine with organic levels and organic molecules in that water, and I'm going to start chewing it up. And I'm only going to have a, a certain percentage left. And maybe because of the water quality. My free chlorine is going to give me 50 ppm. That's still pretty good, but you got to remember that free chlorine is going to be in equilibrium between that OCL and HOCL and OCL minus form. So again, we may be putting in an amount in our water, maybe 100 ppm, and we're reading 50 ppm of free and active or free chlorine. But really remember only about maybe half of that may be active. Especially about, again, if our, I'm maintaining my water quality of water pH of 7.5. So when you're trying to figure out how much you need in a system and, you know, what's going to be effective, not only just for sanitation and safety, but your water quality. And you may be seeing may, uh, a lot more spoilage and you go, I'm putting in 100 part per million here. But really, if you're not maintaining proper pH of that water system, you may be only getting of that 100 ppm, 25 in the free and active form. And if you let your pH drift up, to 8.5, you may be only getting a very small percentage, maybe 2.5. And this is maybe the cause of some of the issues that you may be having. So yeah, when you're doing this, again, you have to keep this all in consideration. Now, that dark blue section of how much is actually being used, it gets into a concept known as breakpoint chlorination. And breakpoint chlorination is really, it comes from water treatment, is when we're trying to treat water or distribution, but it it has application here. When you start adding chlorine to a water system, if there are any metal ions, sulfides, nitrate, anything in that water, that chlorine is going to start being chewed up before it has the chance to form HOCl. Now, as you continue adding chlorine to that system, you'll if there's any ammonia compound, the breaking down of organic materials, you might have ammonia or some some other ammonia or nitrogen containing compounds. 
you might start forming monochloramine. So ammonia in the water may start dropping and you start producing monochloramines. And a lot of times when your uh, workers are smelling chlorine odors, what they're actually smelling is the production of these chloramines in a water system. And as chloramines are being formed, monochloramines, dichloramine is formed, and you might actually form trichloramines or nitrogen trichloride. And at this point, when you started, when you've just broken down all those other chemistries in the water, at this point, and only at this point, will you start producing hypochlorous acid. So it was funny because we actually did, again, a lot of folks who were involved in this, Laura and I, and the folks up at Cornell, and the leader of this grant, Michelle Danilk and I, were all sitting in the lab trying to make chlorine blanks for a lab for a training we were doing up in Geneva. We were putting in a lot of chlorine and we had the calculations and we were really smart. We had our little tables out and we were putting in the amount of chlorine that we needed. And lo and behold, we were not getting the HOCL we expected. So we were deriving the formula and we kept putting more in and we put in twice as much as we calculated. And we still didn't get the amount that we were expecting. And we were scratching our heads, but this was a clear example of us not taking into account the break point for the reactions needed. Now, they could have been the water that we're using. And again, this was in one of the Geneva labs, so the water was probably fine. We were using glassware of unknown origin and that glassware may have had soap residues in it, and that might have been an issue. Our starting concentration of our bleach solution, which again, we, we had calculated to be 5%, but it does break down over time, and maybe we're only using 3% or 2%. But by not taking this all into account, the amount of chemistry we think we, we thought that we needed was not nearly enough. So as your water gets dirtier, what ends up happening is the amount of chemistry you need to maintain an efficacious level is going to go up because you're going to be adding soil to these systems as you're, especially in a recirculating system. And the amount of chemistry you need to overcome that organic load and maybe the, the nitrogen forming compounds that you have in there is only going to increase as that water gets dirtier and dirtier. So maybe at the beginning of day and you're running a 10,000 gallon flume tank, you may be putting in X number of gallons per minute, maybe five gallons per minute. By the end of the day, you may be putting in 10 or 15 just to maintain that same 100 ppm of free chlorine, which again is only going to yield us 50 ppm of that HOCl. So water quality, when we start talking about turbidity labor later, is super important because remember, we're trying to maintain a certain amount of, of free chlorine in the system, and we wanted that chlorine to be free and active. And the amount we're going to need is going to fluctuate as the water quality degrades over time. Now, a lot of this can be a little bit confusing, especially for if you're teaching an audience that may not understand all the names that you're seeing up here and all the different chemical reactions, and again, may not have a handle on pH. So what we've done as part of this grant, and just because I like playing with blocks and making videos, I've made a couple of really simple chemistry videos that kind of explain this. And they're about a minute to a minute and a half long. I'm not going to show them all, but if, again, you're addressing an audience, or if you don't have a really, can't remember high school chemistry because it was really a long time ago, what we've done is we've made a couple of these videos. There's three of them, and they can be found on the contact website under the clarifying the confusion videos. And there's a whole bunch of videos here, not just on chemistry, but I, I encourage you to check them out. But again, there's also my uh, YouTube page. All you have to do is Google KRS underscore UF at YouTube. And you can find these three videos there and they're free to use. Just help yourself or visit the contact page. And again, they explain what's going on in kind of simple uh, children's block format. So they're a good training tool. And again, if you're not really familiar and you want to catch up, this is a really good way of, you know, what, how these chemistries are being formed, why pH is so important, and why adding more chemistry rather than trying to maintain pH is a bad strategy. So if you have the opportunity, check these out. And again, you need any training aids, you can find them there. We're also going to post these on the National Clearinghouse as well. They'll be at that resource as well. So we've talked about the chemistry and let's talk a brief word about turbidity because I mentioned water quality a couple of times. And in our standard PSA training, we mentioned turbidity. And it's a way of determining the frequency of change of our water. And the question is, why is it so important? Well, the whole breakpoint argument that we talked about in maintaining or putting the amount in that's necessary to marine efficacious is one of the reasons we look at turbidity. Now, turbidity isn't like the perfect measurement for this. 
what we're really trying to do is look at the sanitizer demand of a system. And maybe a better measurement is chemical demand or COD. There's another one, biochemical oxygen demand or BOD, but those don't actually capture all of the demand that we've seen that break point chart before, but it's a good, cheap, easy way of guesstimating. As our turbidity goes up, the demand is going to go up and the more sanitizer we're going to need. And at that point, we have to figure out some way we're going to either automate that system or on even just an eyeball comparison chart here where I see the water starts changing. I need to know that I'm going to have to add maybe two gallons per hour or five gallons per hour as that water gets dirtier to maintain that same level of hypochlorous acid in that system, that free and active form, to make sure I maintain efficacy and I don't start spreading or allowing cross-contamination to occur. You can use COD. The problem with COD is it takes about three hours to run. Excuse me. It takes about three hours to run and it is problematic. You can use TDS, total dissolved solids, TSS, total suspended solids. But really, if you're going to use just a quick and dirty test, no pun intended, PIDID is a really good way of guesstimating that demand that system has. And the reason we want to guesstimate demand Again, we want to maintain a, a level of disinfectant or sanitizer in that water. That one is going to maintain that zero E. coli we talked about way at the beginning of this talk. But we also want to prevent that cross-contamination from occurring. So really two things. One, we're going to maintain that water quality so we meet the FDA standards. But we're also going to prevent cross-contamination in the rare instance that a pathogen makes it into our system. And by maintaining a certain sanitizer level, we can prevent the cross-contamination. We're never going to remove the contamination completely. Remember, it's not a kill step, but what we're going to do is prevent the cross-contamination, and that's always a plus. So again, that's what we talk about turbidity and why it's so important. It has to really all the way back with, again, maintaining that free and active form of chlorine or sanitizer in our system. Now, the other topic we touch on is temperature of the water, and why that's really important is really two things. One, water temperature can affect the efficacy of our sanitizer. Some sanitizers react slower. It's a chemical reaction. And if the water's colder, the chemical reaction occurs a little bit more slowly. Some of them are really don't care what the temperature is. The activity is such that it will work just as well cold or it's not. If your water's too hot, again, you can drive off sodium hypochlorite. You can actually form chlorine gas if your pH is too low. And again, your water temperature is too hot. But one thing we're trying to prevent is the other part of this is temperature differentials between our fruit and, and the water. If we have temperature differentials, we have the potential for internalizing. So not only does it affect the efficacy of our sanitizers, but what it also does is it reduces the potential for infiltration. And this is what this looks like. And this was a study done out of Jerry Bartz's lab at the plant pathology department here at the University of Florida. But again, this was actually done even before. This was shown by Bobby Cannon back in the late 1990s. And we, we've done some work with dye infiltration. Again, if you put a warm piece of fruit in a cold recirculating system, especially a flume system, what can happen is as that hot fruit starts to chill down, you can form a, a vacuum in the air. Uh, spaces in between the vesicles and it just forms a vacuum and it draws water in into the internal sorts of the uh, parts of the produce. In this case, if you put it into a blue dye, you can see the dye being drawn well into the tomato. But in the PSA training, we see that with a cantaloupe in some of the pictures there. Now, bacteria don't migrate this far. Again, they're much bigger. They don't will move much more freely. But again, the work earlier work that Dr. Bartz did, the temperature differential when you made when you had this hot produce going into cold water systems, the there was an increase in market disease. You saw more spoilage and more rot in these things. So we were internalizing those organisms. And again, other studies have shown that you can, depending how long the fruit is in the water, what the temperature differential is, and what the even what the plant species are. You can actually drive pathogens in. And there was a paper by Bin Joe at a, a Sunny Luzo up in USDA back in 2014. And again, they were able to internalize. This is just one study, but there's been a lot of studies that have shown, especially if you hold them at under a certain depth for an extended period of time uh, and depending on that temperature differential. Now, if you don't, if you have a differential and you don't have a whole lot of exposure time, if they're in and out of a flume tank with less than 30 seconds, or if you have a showering system like a hydro cooler or a brush bed or a spray bar situation, you don't get that internalization where 
you get it in a flume type of situation where, again, there's an opportunity for, again, that water to be drawn into the center. So temperature is super important. Not only does it affect the efficacy, because again, some chemistries are more sensitive to temperature changes, but we really want to limit infiltration if possible. So again, if we're using a recirculating system, especially if we're not using a sanitizer, there's a potential of the pathogen washing off into that water. And if there's a temperature differential, that water being internalized. Now, here in Florida, and we're one of the only states, and tomatoes are the only commodity within the state that have a requirement to have a 10 degree temperature differential on flume systems compared to the pulp temperature of the incoming fruit. We also are one of the few that mandate a minimum sanitizer requirement. And for tomatoes, it's 150 parts per million, which is fairly high. It's one of the higher ones. But that was set up back in the TGAPS program that started 2007, 2008, and we still have it to this day. And that was a response to all the outbreaks we were having with tomatoes back in the early 2000s. But other than that, there really is no mandated or prescribed level of sanitizer or temperature differential. They just want you to be aware of those and minimize them as much as possible. All right. So we mentioned the chlorine concentration. The gold standard, again, if you look in AOAC manuals and you look at sanitizer tests, Really, in, in a laboratory setting, in clean glassware and clean water, I really only needed like a half a part per million to kill a million E. coli. E. coli is not really that resistant. Most organisms are killed fairly easily with chlorine. The problem is we're not in a lab situation in the real world, and we have a lot of demand in our system. And again, we're going to have to reach that break point. So we're using, use, we're using a lot more chemistry. And typically, when you look at recommendations, you'll see numbers anywhere from 50 to 200 part per million. 200 seems a little bit excessive now, but if you look through some of the literature, you'll see numbers that are going to be 50 to 200. I've seen people use chemistries in spray bars as low as maybe 10 to 15, but maybe 25. But again, you don't need a whole lot, but what you have to do is you have to overcome the losses due to the amount of load or demand that comes into the system. And what you don't want to do is as you're constantly dumping fruit into a system, that you don't ever bottom out and you hit zero. Because once you hit zero, you no longer can guarantee that you're not getting a cross-contamination and you need a minimum amount in that water to prevent that cross-contamination. And again, keep that small problem from becoming a big one. So typically we never go that low. We always typically are gonna err on the high side. What you choose is really up to you. And again, I've seen numbers in the literature, anywhere from flume systems from 50 to, and again, in Florida, we're, we're mandated 150. For spray bars, I've seen numbers from 10 up to 25. I don't need a whole lot. I just have to make sure I understand the quality of my water and how much I'm going to need to make sure that I don't have that cross-contamination. Typically, recirculating systems, because we're building up that organic load over many hours during the day, or in the case of some hydrocoolers, weeks, I need enough sanitizer in there to maintain the efficacy. And that is can be problematic because, again, depending on even with tomato harvesting, a single your first harvest may be very clean. If I'm doing a third pick on that field, the amount of waste coming into that field may be much higher. So, again, the time of year is going to go into... Uh, or what pick I'm using, the type of crop I may use. If I'm using a root crop versus um, a vine stalk type, type crop, again, the amount of organic loads coming into the system is going to be different. So you need to know how much organic load is being, or a load is coming into that. Typically, we want to measure our chemistry. We just don't want to randomly throw it in there. And there's a bunch of different ways we can do it. One of the most common one is test strips. And if you're going to use test strips, they're not highly recommended. Again, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But if you're going to use test strips, just make sure you're getting the ones that are for free chlorine and not total. This particular one I have an image of is does both. But really, you only need test strips are going to look for free chlorine. One of the reasons we tend not to use test strips or they're frowned upon in certain areas is that they're they're accurate, but they're not very precise. I may have a gradation where I have 0, 50, 150, 200. So if I'm trying to hit a target of 50, I, if I'm going to be hard to distinguish whether I'm at 30 or 70. I don't have enough scaling in between. So that becomes problematic. I can use colorimetric tests. This is a handheld spectrum. I have a really fancy one. The problem is with a lot of colorimetric tests, they only read very low concentrations, maybe two part per million, or maybe some of them go up to five. But if I'm trying to get 50 part per million in there, I'm going to have a problem because that is it's overload that test and I'm not going to be able to tell how much is in there. So what I have to do is a dilution. So in some cases, I have to do a one to 10 or maybe a one to 100 dilution 
which again, isn't that hard. I can use pipettes and uh, certain containers. The problem becomes is I have to be very precise with my dilution, maybe using a graduated cylinder. I have to use maybe a calibrated pipette because any errors I make in my dilution are going to be multiplied by a factor of 10 or 100. And again, I want to be as precise as possible. The great thing about these uh, tests are it gives me an actual number. So where the free chlorine test strip is going to give me a range is sort of 50-ish maybe between 50 and 100 if it's uh, going between those two different shades of color. This is going to give me a digital readout. I'm going to have a number I can write down on my clipboard. And as long as I do my dilution properly, and I'm not using dirty water to do my dilution, I'm using distilled water, I'm using clean pipettes, I'm using clean glassware or disposable glassware, and I'm not producing any error, I'm going to get a digital readout and I may, I may get 50.5. I may get a nice number that I can be very comfortable or I feel very confident in that number. But again, these can be expensive and I can run into issues because again, if I'm not very precise with my measurements, I can propagate that error and my numbers can be off. And the third and last one, which is very common, is a, a pool titration kit. And if you've ever, for those of you who have ever done pool titrations or chemistry titrations in lab, these are another type of colorimetric test where I'm adding drops. And in some cases, I can use these depending on the strength of my reagents. I may not have to do a dilution at all. I, I may not have the resolution because again, maybe each drop is worth 20 part per million. But again, I can do this. These are fairly inexpensive. They're very easy to run. And again, they're going to be give me a little bit more accuracy compared to a test strip. But all three of these, again, FDA does not mandate which one of these you have to use. They don't even mandate, it. again, the use of sanitizer. But if you're going to use a sanitizer, you're going to have to monitor that. And just choose a method that works for you that's economic and that's going to give you the precision you're going to feel comfortable with. And again, you may have to be dealing, you may be dealing with an auditor and that auditor may specify, hey, you have to use a specific test. Just realize that is a, an auditor request, not a, a regulatory request. And there's a difference there. Again, we just talked about each one of these. Uh, then test strips are very commonly used. Many audits won't let you use them. But remember, FDA is different from the audits. They don't really mandate their use. But again, many schemes will recommend not using these. Those colorimetric tests are more accurate. But again, I'm going to have to perform these dilutions. And the dilutions can propagate these errors. So you have to be have somebody who is practiced and is well trained when doing these. Again, they're not very difficult, but again, you just want to make sure that somebody is trained in doing these correctly. Now, the other one you might have heard of is oxidation reduction potential ORP. Again, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with ORP. It works really great, especially in clean water. You set your ORP meter to read a specific millivolt. And as you add more chemistry, those millivolts will go up. As that chemistry is depleted, they'll drop down. And again, I can automate my system because my RP meter, as it stops below, below a certain threshold, and here in this graph, so let's say 800, a pump turns on and distributes more chemistry out into the system. And that's a great way of automating chemistry, chemical introduction into a system. The issue is with ORP, you have to be super careful. As the water gets dirtier, the correlation between the millivolts and the actual chlorine in the system becomes less reliable. And this is just an example of uh, some systems that we have tested here in Florida over the course of six to eight hour days. And again, at 800 in clean water systems, my, my ADP, my 800 millivolts was reading right about 180 part per million chlorine, which is fine. As that water got dirtier though, the actual amount of chlorine in the system was really only around 30. So even though the millivolts were the same, the actual amount of free chlorine in the system was much less. So in a recirculating system, while ORP is a great way to introduce chemistry into the system and automate the process, it's not a real reliable method for actually monitoring. And we still recommend, and most people recommend that if you're gonna use an ORP system, which are great for automation, is that you still do those routine checks. Typically they're hourly, but again, there is no mandated frequency for those. But ORP, again, is good. And single pass system is really good because, again, you're not going to be building up organic. You can start with the same clean water system. They work really good in single pass systems, non-recirculating systems. But for recirculating systems, just know, uh, one, the measurements become less reliable as, as the day goes on or that water picks up demand. So, again, they do have their uh, benefits and they also have their drawbacks. Some advantages and disadvantages. Chlorine is broad spectrum. It kills a lot of different things. It really works good in hard water situations. It works pretty good at low temperatures. It's really inexpensive. doesn't leave a film. You do have to do a freshwater rinse on produce. But again, we have a lot of data on this one. 
problems is that if I don't monitor my pH, I can actually loop chlorine gas, which is not really good. It's really active, but unfortunately, if it's really active, it means it can be corrosive and it can also be an irritant. So we have to make sure that we're not rusting out our equipment. It can be unstable in diluted forms and there are environmental concerns. I can get disinfection byproducts, especially if my pH goes up higher. So from an environmental discharge standpoint, again, we have some concerns. The second most common one out there is parasitic acids. We know these as PAA. There's a lot of different brands on the market. Typically, PAAs are a combination of proxy acids and hydrogen peroxide. Typically, you'll see a surfactant, a wetting agent added to these as well. And these are used at common concentrations of around 24 to 85 ppm on most applications. And again, there's another common chemistry we see. The great thing about this, again, leaves no residue. It's usually not as corrosive as, as a chlorine one. It's relative resistant to organic and soil buildup where chlorine is highly effective. PAAs tend not to be as nearly effective and they re re maintain their efficacy even when the water starts to get dirtier. Much more environmentally friendly. We're not getting those disinfection byproducts being formed. Broad range, I don't have to worry about my pH with this particular sanitizer and is particularly active against biofilm, which is good. Disadvantages, it does have some sensitivity to metal ions. It does corrode soft metals like aluminum. It smells like vinegar. Again, it's an acetic acid. If you've ever worked in a dark room, you know that, you know the odor. So yeah, it's, it's problematic. So you have to get good ventilation. Again, like any concentrated solutions, it can be an irritant and it does have varied activity against fungal organisms. I'm going to mo monitoring considerations. I can use test strips. Titration is probably the preferred method for this. ORP is not really good for PAA. There's a lot more variation here, but they do. there are some inline detection devices that can be used if the cost is warranted. But again, it's a really good alternative. One of the, one of the better ones too is it's considered organic for organic production. Costs a little bit more. Remember from our ideal sanitizers, cost is always an issue. But again, maybe if you're producing organic, you're going to get the, a value added bump out of that and it makes it, makes it worth other things to consider when using any sanitizer, and again, I, I we haven't talked about chlorine dioxide, we haven't talked about ozone or any other ones that are out there, but you always want to make sure that you're checking the state, federal, and local environmental restrictions. Because again, if I'm dumping my flume tanks, which are 10, 20,000 gallons, and they're jacked up to 100 parts per million sodium hypochlorite, I just can't dump that down the drain. I may have to have a, a drain field. I might have to have special water disposal considerations in place. You might have water availability issues, and, which may prevent you from changing your water every day. Especially in South Florida here, we have water limitations, especially around the coastal areas. So again, you might have to run longer. And if you run longer, we're going to have more buildup. And if we have more buildup, now we have to make sure that we're really maximizing the efficacy of that water. Economics, the one thing we don't want you to do, again, remember, you're not required to have a sanitizer. So I don't want to force you into that. So there's always economics. And you might say it's cheaper not to use a sanitizer, but we're always trying to prevent that small problem from becoming a big problem. One thing we didn't really get into because, again, just for time constraints is the buildup of or the potential buildup of biofilms. And again, even if we're not trying to prevent cross-contamination, the prevention of the buildup of biofilms on equipment um, is also one of the reasons we might choose a particular sanitizer or sanitizers in combination. And lastly, again, we mentioned with the PAA, if I'm of trying to get into organic production, I want to choose a sanitizer that's going to meet all those regulations associated with NOP and those types of operations. So in summary, I'm, I went a little bit over here, but one, no perfect sanitizer out there. You're going to have a lot of salespeople coming up to you saying that theirs is good. Again, typically there's gonna be studies, ask for them. If you're gonna use a sanitizer, make sure it is approved. EPA comes with EPA registration number and is approved for its intended use. Again, there's a lot of different sanitizers that can work for your operation. You're not gonna be locked into one. If you're gonna use a sanitizer, make sure you're properly monitoring it. Again, what we're trying to prevent is that cross-contamination. We wanna use a level that's gonna prevent that. And really the best way to do this is no your chemistry and your water parameters. We went over a couple of those today. And again, in a really abbreviated fashion, those who know me know I can talk for hours or more on this. So yeah, know your water chemistry. If you have any questions, reach out to one of the extension folks, people on this team, reach out to me if you'd like. I will gladly talk your ear off on water chemistry and water quality. And there's a lot of really great folks out here in the extension community that can help you out on this. So with that, I will take any questions if there are any.
Uh, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Schneider. Keith, that was wonderful. You maintained a great audience the entire time. For those remaining Q&A, we will go ahead and address those. We'll also be posting the recording of this presentation, as well as our key takeaways. You can always find those on our contact website, as well as our Produce Safety Science YouTube page. And please join us November 10th for Dr. Shauna Rock. She's going to start to tackle agricultural water and risk. And then we're going to follow that up in December with Dr. Don Schaffner with part two. So it should be a great end of the year. So we hope we see you all. And thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it.